bienvenida a los pares, eh, darle la bienvenida a la doctora Carmen Elena Rodríguez Guerrero, evaluadora externa de la Universidad de Hospital. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos en este proceso. Darle también la, la bienvenida al doctor Carlos Rico Concoso, evaluador externo de la Pontificia Universidad de Javeriana. Muchas gracias por colaborarnos como evaluadores externos de la productividad académica del profesor, del libro de investigación. Y darle la bienvenida también a la profesora Luz Daria Ariasota, como evaluadora interna de la Universidad Pedagógica Nacional. Este es un acto sumamente importante para los profesores de planta de la universidad que les permite a ellos ubicarse en la categoría más, a, más alta, comprendida la normatividad de la universidad, siendo esta la de titular, permitiéndoles una cualificación y una eh, modificación también en tema salarial y tanto en el tema de eh, cualificación docente dentro del marco de la universidad y las normas pues, que nos rigen. Eh, les concederé el uso de la palabra ya a mi compañero Miguel de la Secretaría General, quien les indicará el orden del día para el desarrollo del acto de sustentación pública y los eh, como requisitos que debemos cumplir para poder surtir esta ascenso y darle eh, total éxitos al profesor en este proceso de sustentación y pues darle la bienvenida a la Universidad Pedagógica a todos ustedes. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muy buenos días. Explicamos un poco la dinámica luego de la presentación del profe, pues van a tener eh, un espacio que se va a hablar externo y la profe va a hablar interno. Y pues les agradecemos ratificar o pues darnos la constancia de, de lo que nos dieron previamente en la evaluación luego de la presentación. Entonces un saludo nuevamente y bienvenida a todos los asistentes, a los evaluadores, al profesor Luis Fernando. Y damos inicio hoy 26 de marzo a la sustentación pública del libro de investigación Culture Diversity and Related to Fundamentals to Foster Critical Intercultural Competence y Edgar Education para el ascenso de categoría de asociado titular del profesor Luis Fernando Gómez Rodríguez. Siendo las 10 de la mañana, eh, damos lectura al orden del día, primer punto, instalación del evento, segundo punto, presentación del libro de investigación a cargo del profesor Luis Fernando Gómez Rodríguez. Tercero, intervención de los jurados, doctora Carmen Elena, Elena Guerrero, doctor Carlos Rico Troncoso y la doctora Luz Daria Rizzo. Cuarto, espacio para intercambio con la comunidad cándica y quinto, cierre del evento. Primer punto, instalación del evento. Dando cumplimiento a lo dispuesto en el numeral sexto del artículo cuarto del acuerdo 005 de 2003 del Consejo Académico, por el cual se establecen los criterios y procedimientos para la evaluación del trabajo requerido para ascender a una de las categorías de profesor asociado titular, la Secretaría General, obrando como secretaria del Consejo Académico, se permite dar inicio a la sustentación pública del libro de investigación para el ascenso de categoría a titular del profesor Luis Fernando Gómez Rodríguez. El profesor Luis Fernando Gómez Rodríguez, Posee título de doctorado en enseñanza del inglés y de literatura otorgado por la Universidad del Estado de Illinois, Estados Unidos, así como título de maestría en educación con énfasis en la enseñanza del inglés y la literatura de la Universidad de Cactus, Estados Unidos. Fue docente de cabo por la Comisión Fulbright para realizar estudios de doctorado en el programa de inglés y literatura de la Universidad del Estado de Illinois, Estados Unidos. Actualmente trabaja como profesor asociado en la Universidad de Alberto Nacional de Colombia en los programas de pregrado del Departamento de Lenguas, en el programa de maestría en enseñanza de lenguas extranjeras y en el programa de doctorado interinstitucional en educación. También ha sido investigador del grupo de investigación hipermedia, evaluación y en enseñanza del inglés, reconocido por Colciencia. De igual manera, ha servido como asesor de tesis en los niveles de maestría y doctorado. Otra de sus actividades académicas incluye la publicación de artículos de investigación en varias revistas colombianas e internacionales indexadas, así como ser autor de varios libros de textos de inglés comunicativo para niños y adolescentes en Colombia y Latinoamérica. Sus principales temas de investigación son la competencia intercultural, la pedagogía crítica, el desarrollo profesional de docentes de inglés en formación y la enseñanza de literatura norteamericana y británica en el contexto de inglés como lengua extranjera. Sus libros publicados recientemente son Poster in Listening Skills and Initial Intercultural Community Competence 
the EFL preserves teaching through the use of ICT, cuyos coautores fueron la doctora Luz María Arias y la profesora Esperanza Vera. Y el libro Cultural Diversity and Letter to Fundamentals to Foster Clinical Intercultural Competence in EFL Education. Algunos de sus artículos más recientes son English Learner Voices on Integrating Poetry Through a Transactional Approach in an EFL Classroom en la revista Literatura y Lingüística. Siguiente artículo Learning by Teaching Training EFL Preserved Teacher Through Inquiry Base Approach en la revista Electronic Journal of Foreign Language Teaching. Y por último EFL Learners Intercultural Competence Development Through International News en la revista GIS Education and Learning Research Journal Segundo punto, presentación del libro de investigación a cargo del profesor Luis Fernando okay. Muchas gracias Ok, I'm going to start my presentation by first uh, doing a contextualization about my study This book is the result of my doctoral dissertation that I carried out in, at Illinois State University uh, in the United States. And uh, um, this, is a, a, this is a study support, supported by, a, by an English studies model, which established interdisciplinary connections among literature, TESOL, and pedagogy in support of a pedagogical application of the teaching of multicultural American literature in a Colombian EFL classroom. So I guess that one of the most important contributions of this book is that I try to establish inter, uh, interdisciplinary connections. I think that the EFL, EFL education needs to you know, be supported by other areas in the, hum, in the humanities because today learning English is not only to, to learn the language. We need to do more than that. And therefore, I, particularly for this study, I um, I use interdis interdisciplinary connections such as literature and pedagogy. In the purpose of my book, and which was my dissertation, was to help EFL learners develop intercultural communicative competence uh, through literary texts. This was a qualitative case study carried out at Universidad Pedagogica Nacional, located in Bogotá, Colombia, here. So the participants of my study were my, the students that I had by that time when I did the, when I uh, carried out this, conducted this study, which was in 2010. Well, this study was supported by, by two questions. The first uh, research question was how might advanced EFL learners develop mm -hmm. intercultural communicative competence through the study of multicultural literary short stories of the U.S. at a Colombian university? And the second question was, what part might literature as a content area play in leading EFL learners to become intercultural and competent speakers of English? Uh, in order to, since this is an interdisciplinary study, I think it, that it is important first to give some uh, contextualization of the constructs of this literary study because, like I said before, I'm using literature and maybe for many EFL teachers, uh, are, are not, they are not familiar with those concepts. Uh, in the first chapter, I state that our contemporary world is becoming a more globalized society. And uh, because of this situation, the educational system needs to prepare students to become intercultural beings in a society that is, that is becoming more inclusive and, and diverse. Although it is a fact that we are preparing students to become diverse and to be inclusive and, and to respect the, the difference, um, we still need to do much, still need to do much in order to help create this kind of uh, intercultural society. Mm, I propose in the first uh, chapter of my book that one meaningful way to help EFL learners develop intercultural communicative competence is through the literary text. I recognize that, of course, there are many other ways to help students develop intercultural competence. 
uh, for example, through songs, through uh, news, I mean, there are other resources. But I particularly focused on this, uh, on the literary text, for one main reason. Because by uh, 2010, when I, when I was doing my research, mm, the literary text uh, didn't have much, hasn't been uh, used as a resource to do, uh, to help uh, students develop uh, their intercultural competence. So I was attracted by, by that topic. How could I uh, connect intercultural competence and uh, literature so that students could, could develop intercultural communicative competence? Uh, also in the first chapter, I uh, include some important concepts for readers to understand this interdisciplinar interdisciplinary study. The first one, I give an explanation about uh, the traditional <coughs> white American literary canon, uh, which uh, in general terms, it consists of uh, you know, the, the literary production written by the most recognized American authors uh, who belong to the white society, to the white uh, American society we can mention, for example, Ernest Hemingway, uh, Faulkner, Tennessee Williams, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, who are the big figures of the American literary canon. When I was doing my research, I discovered that most of the people, and even the students here at the university, have that idea that the literary canon only consists of those uh, big figures. But there is a problem. Uh, they are not the only literary figures in, in the America, American literature. There are, there are other authors who are very important and who belong to the minority groups uh, uh, in the United States. So I thought it was very uh, important to include those voices that have been kind of marginalized, uh, to include those voices in, in, the, in this study. Well, that, that is the first concept. The second concept that I explained in, my book, in the first chapter is the conflict that I had as a researcher in terms of authenticity. Because when I was doing my research, uh, uh, well, we as English teachers understand very well what authentic uh, materials are or authentic literary texts because we see authentic literary texts from the point of view of language. And then we give to our students authentic materials in our class. Uh, sometimes we tell them to read new pieces of news or uh, journal article or, I mean, different materials for us is very clear. But when I, I was doing my study, I had a conflict with my literature uh, teachers because they didn't understand why I was working on authentic text. For them, authenticity is more related to identity. So I thought it was very important to clarify this because there was a conflict. Why? Because they see authentic text from the point of view of uh, identity, which is it's a, compli a complicated term. And therefore, for example, Perez Torres and Ansaldúa consider that homogeneous cultural authenticity is a fraud term. It doesn't exist. For in the literary studies, authenticity uh, is problematic because they say that there is not an authentic culture. And it is true. For example, our Colombian culture is influenced by many, by many other cultures, for example, by the American culture. In that sense, I thought it was very important to clarify these two concepts in, in, in my book. And it was a very important element because it was like, a, like the first step to understand intercultural competence as intercultural competence deals with the issues of identity. Uh, so I explain in one part of the first chapter this, this um, concept. In, in literary studies, they propose that uh, cultural uh, authenticity is more related to hybridity and heterogene heterogeneity because all of us are completely different. And all of the cultural groups in the world, although we tend to stereotype cultural groups, we, we can say Americans are like this or 
Colombian people are like this, you know, we give them like static characteristics. In fact, it is a fraud because all of us are different. So we cannot say that a cultural group is completely uh, homogeneous. We need to speak in literary studies about hybridity and heterogeneity, implying that all of us are uh, completely different and therefore identity and culture are complex terms. Also, I explain the definition of uh, multicultural literature, which in general terms uh, refers to the literary productions produced by, like I said before, a minority groups in the United States, including, for example, Native Americans, African Americans, Mexican Americans, um, and also uh, disabled people who are never heard, or those people who are marked by gender, like le gays, lesbians, etc. So they are the voices that, the new voices that, like, like I said at the beginning, do not belong to the American canon, or didn't belong to the traditional American canon, but now they are part of the literary canon. Because the literary canon in the United States is now more inclusive, you know, and they are being recognized as important voices of American literature. And the other concept, is intercultural communicative competence, which I am I'm going to explain in a few minutes. Uh, of course, my, my research is based on a statement uh, of, of a problem. And I have four aspects or four limitations that I identify as a researcher when doing my, my, my study. <coughs> it was in uh, 2010. And at that time, I had a group of advanced students who were more concerned about learning grammatical forms and communicative functions, functions than fostering intercultural communicative competence. In fact, when I asked them about what culture was or what intercultural communicative competence was, they didn't have any idea about, about it. They have like a notion, but they didn't have clear what a competence was. So I thought it was very important to work on intercultural competence because they were more um, eager at that time to learn grammar and to, to work with language than, than, than to actually uh, work on cultural issues or intercultural issues. The second limitation that I had at that time is, uh, was that these advanced learners lack appropriate knowledge of cultural content and they knew more about surface le levels of, of culture. By surface culture, I, I refer to, to the fact that they, they knew information about, for example, holidays, food, uh, music, uh, celebrities, important touristic places, but no more than that. And actually, in previous English classes, they gave little presentation, uh, short presentations on, on these topics, but they never studied those, you know, like all their kind of more complicated uh, context re uh, topics related to, to, to deep culture. So I thought it was a necessity, and as a researcher, I, I considered that the literary text was a powerful means to help them uh, work on those elements of deep culture. The third uh, limitation was that the instructional materials were mostly based on non-authentic texts, as they worked with photocopies to practice grammar. You know, like we teachers many times give our students photocopies taken from other books to work on grammar, and they do the activities. Or we use a communicative textbook, or we, we bring to the classroom a movie or any other kind of, kind of material. But actually, the literary text is absent. So I thought it would be interesting to include the literary texts as a means to help them develop intercultural uh, competence. And of course, like I said before, deep culture needed to be approached in the EFL classroom. That was uh, what I found as the statement of the problem. Well, later in chapter two, I present some concepts of intercultural and multicultural competence. Here I include one definition of intercultural competence, because there are many. 
I chose uh, Michael, uh, Byron's, Nicholson's, and Stevenson's definition, which says, the ability to interact with others, to accept other perspectives and perceptions of the world, to mediate between different perspectives, and to be conscious of the evaluations of difference. Just to understand what it is, and I know you, you are experts on, the to on this topic too, so I won't give any more details. But what is interesting to say is that intercultural communicative competence is still uh, used by scholars around the world in different ways, because it is a topic that is in exploration, that is being investigated, even at this moment. And uh, it has uh, different names such as global learning, global competence, international competence, and multicultural competence. So it indicates that, that it is a very interesting topic of research at the present. And I also explain in chapter two, uh, intercultural communica communicative competence, but I am going to do it through this, uh, let's say this figure that I designed, uh, which are the main components of the inter intercultural communicative competence. This is a model proposed by Byron, who speaks about uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, the three main components of intercultural competence. I know you have already read about that too. I just want to clarify that uh, knowledge, of course, the, that the intercultural speaker, when interacting with other people or when, with, when interacting with uh, any material, uh, acquires knowledge uh, of beliefs, traditions, uh, ideologies, and at the same time, the intercultural speaker develops three important skills. The first one is the skill of discovering, the second one is the skill of relating, and the third one is the skill of interpreting. And at the same time, uh, the intercultural speaker develops attitudes like openness, tolerance, readiness, you know. But it is very interesting because according to Byron's model, the intercultural speaker, the speaker develops these skills at the same time. They are mutually together and they are one depending on the other. It is similar to the concept of, and it is an extension of the communicative competence. Well, this is just to, re to, to review. Uh, so in chapter number two, I explain these this, this awards. Actually, they, there are five awards, but I simplified that, that, that model into these, these three ones. In chapter number three, I talk about uh, the importance of multicultural literature in the language classroom. So I explain the definition of, of, um, of intercultural uh, communicative, uh, of multicultural literature as given by, by many authors like Bishop, Arana, Magai, and Francie, and Lothar who belong to literary studies. They don't belong to the full context. Remember that I was doing an interdisciplinary study. Um, and then uh, I, would like you, I would like to read one section from page number 90 so that you have like uh, an idea of what a multicultural literature is about. You have the book. I'm going to read page 90 at the beginning. It says Desenbrock at the be very beginning. Desenbrock involves alternative ways of experiencing the world. He asks the question, what, why should we read multicultural literature? Reading multicultural literature does not only depend on the inclusion of minor minority writers in the curriculum to be sure the curriculum reflects the diversity of the world's population represented in the canon. And not only that, but it is very interesting to do that, you know, as a teacher, and also to work with multicultural literature with, with the students. We should read multicultural literature, the same rock argues, because a work of genuine power will confront us with things we haven't confronted before. The confrontation, no matter what our ethnic identity might be, will cause us to come face to face with our own values in a way which will either cause those values to change 
or cause us to become more aware of them and more reflected about their value, and to prepare students for the complex ethical theater which is life, particularly life today. And it is on these grounds that I think we should argue for its place in the curriculum today. So I think this is a very important argument to understand, first of all, what multicultural literature is and the purpose it has, which can also be applied in the EFL context. I also explain in chapter two the main goals of or objectives of multicultural literature as suggested by Kay, Crosby and Land. They, there are basically three. Uh, the first one is that, uh, the first goal is that through uh, multicultural literature, students can expand their knowledge of the world, which is one of the basic uh, uh, goals. The second one is through multicultural literature, students can reduce prejudice and resist attitudes in a society, in a world that still is uh, uh, dominated by violence, uh, discrimination, racism, uh, prejudice. And the third one is that multicultural literature offers students the possibility to appreciate literary techniques and manifestations produced by other cultural groups that not necessarily belong to the traditional literary canon, the, the, big, the big figures. Well, I also explain in this chapter the inclusion of literature in the language classroom as there were in the past opponents, but now in the present there are more proponents who uh, consider that literature should be included in the EFL classroom as a powerful means, not only uh, uh, as a material to help students uh, improve their, la their language, but also uh, gain cultural knowledge. And uh, I also talk about theory and practice in the, in the use of literary texts in the EFL classroom. But when I was doing my research uh, and I was reading you know, many books about this topic, I found a, a very interesting finding. The emphasis was on the mainstream. By the mainstream, I refer to the traditional literary canon. So most of the researchers who do, who include the literary texts uh, in, in the EFL context, they use the big figures, that, the, the, the old version of the, of the, of the literary canon. Then they end up uh, teaching Hemingway and Poe and the big figures because they are not aware that there are other uh, important writers that now are being recognized by this uh, canon. So it emphasized my idea that at least for my, for my research study here, uh, it was important to include voices from, from uh, the minority groups. I also present some theoretical perspectives for the inclusion of literature in EFL. Uh, and according to my investigation, most of EFL teachers use literature as a resource, not as content rather as a resource in order to teach uh, learners develop the uh, four communicative skills, you know, literature for practicing reading or practicing um, uh, writing or, or learning vocabulary. That has been the, the main purpose, literature as a, as, a, as a resource. And this is supported by um, or reported by authors like McRee, Carter and Long, Parent cramps. In this chapter, I also uh, present existing case studies and actual research studies about the teaching of literature in EFL. But still, those research studies are uh, the, the main emphasis is on the traditional literary canon. Well, in chapter number four. Like, since my purpose was to teach students, uh, to help students develop intercultural competence through literature, as a teacher researcher, I thought it was important to count on approaches to teach literature. 
Um, if you can go to page 116, please. <coughs> I state this, this idea for me as a researcher doing this study. It is in the second paragraph, the teaching of literature. It says, the teaching of literature in any classroom, whether in our native language or in the EFL classroom, should not only be based on merely teaching the literary text itself. The literary text should be studied through the use of appropriate teaching approaches that might provide the possibility to negotiate meaning and construct knowledge. Therefore, I needed to do more research because I said, okay, I'm going to teach literary texts uh, in my class, but based on what? I need pedagogical basis to do that. Uh, and this is also part of the inter interdisciplinary connection that I, that I uh, did. I found or I classified, uh, found and classified several pedagogical uh, approaches to uh, teach literature that are used in, 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 in literary studies, but that can be applied in the EFL context. So the first one is contextualization of contact zones. It is a, a method proposed by Pratt, and as the name suggests, is when students get together and they you know, they take a literary text, they read it, and they establish to identify what the uh, cultural content and literary content the text uh, provides. Also, there, there is this interesting um, uh, approach, which it is one of my favorite ones, which is called Engagement and Debate and Conflict in the Classroom, proposed by James Garcia because he is an author who says that we English teachers and literature teachers teach these topics in a very congratulatory way. By congratulatory, like we teach safe topics, like for example, uh, music, for example, uh, uh, achievements of a cultural group, but we never you know, confront students with conflict and debate. And then he criticized that aspect. So it, it would be, he said that it is very interesting for us as literature teachers or English teachers to create debate in the classroom. Because when they do that, students are completely changed and they face reality, okay? So I have to confess that this is one of my favorite uh, approaches. The other one is the practice of historicizing uh, proposed by Keating and Lauter who uh, indicate that we need to see history as a tool to, to teach literature, but in a critical way. Not, it is not just to you know, memorize historical events, but to put it in a critical way. Relational teaching, as the name suggests, is to establish relationships in between people coming from different cultural backgrounds or establishing relationships between cultural uh, relationships between what the author presents in the literary text and the student's personal lives. And um, she also talks about one interesting topic that is called rela uh, commonalities, um, which I also like, very, I like it very much because instead of looking for differences, cultural differences in the literary text or any other materials, what we try to, to find is find commonalities, common, uh, let's say, beliefs or common cultural practices. So I thought it was very interesting to use these approaches in the EFL context. And there are these social constructivist pedagogy, pedagogy uh, approaches, but I won't speak about that because we in the EFL context know about that very well. Well, in chapter number five, I needed, uh, I needed to include, like, what, what could be at that time, what could be the criteria to choose the literary text to help my students develop intercultural communicative competence. And therefore, finally, I decided to use short stories because at the beginning I was going to say, I'm going to use poems, um, novels. And I said, and of course, with my thesis director at that time, we decided to work on short stories. There are several reasons for. Uh, for, for this choice. 
The first one is because short stories are easy to read with EFL learners because they are usually brief compositions, mostly dealing with one single plot. And they get more motivated to read that kind of short stories uh, of material. The second one is that learners can read them in a short period of time and become motivated to hold class discussion. And the third one is that short stories should be related in some way to a student's experiences. Uh, and, and the last one, short stories are appealing, should be appealing in the target culture. In other words, that students enjoy reading those materials. According to my experience as a teacher, students enjoy more reading short stories than poetry. They, they find poetry more complicated and, 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 and novels, uh, they, they, they get very tired, you know, like when they read novels. But when they read short stories, they get more um, interested in, in those uh, kinds of materials. So in chapter number five, I will give all the explanation about that important aspect. Well, this is finally one sample. This is just one sample of multicultural, of the multicultural short stories that I used to conduct this study. And like you, like you can see in the table, I used two uh, Mexican-American short stories uh, written by Sandra Cisneros, 11, a woman hollering creek. I also used uh, one U.S. Puerto Rican short story, Grandma's Wake, by Emilio um, Diaz Balcácer, Balcácer, because I wanted my students to see that also the colonies of the United States, like Puerto Rico, are part of the multicultural lens. And they, uh, it was very surprising because at that time they didn't, they didn't know that you know that, for example, Emilia Diaz Balcácer now belongs to the American literary canon. So for them, it was new cultural information that they really enjoyed. And this is this short story was written in Spanish, and and then uh, was translated in into English. So they were reading the translation. So part, and that is part of the you know intercultural process. That they, that they were having when I was, of course, doing the pedagogical intervention with them. I also chose a Jewish-American uh, short story, The First Seven Years, by Bernard Malamud, and two African-American short stories, one by Alice Walker, Everyday Use, and the other uh, short story written by Dick Gregory, uh, and the story's name is uh, Shame. Well, the context for the research study was uh, the study was carried out in one advanced English class of the Modern Language Program at, at UPN in 2010. So while I was doing my doctoral studies there, I have to come to come one year here to you know to do the pedagogical intervention, to collect data. Um, uh, you know how researchers do do this uh, this this step. And it was uh, in 2010 and a, a follow-up semester in 2011. Here the language uh, program, a program that prepares uh, EFL students to become English teachers. Um, the participants of this study were uh, 23 advanced EFL learners, ages 18 to 22. They were student teachers who were preparing to become teachers in Colombia. They have several problems with grammar, pronunciation, and spelling due to the fact that they were still going through a learning process. One interesting characteristic of my participants at that time is that they have never read multicultural li literature before. It was something new for them. And they have never read uh, authentic literary texts. So that was the challenge of my, my study. It was a qualitative, uh, the research, research methodology was a qualitative case study. I wanted to collect data about my students' opinions, reactions, and idea, which were related to the two research questions guiding the study. In other words, how the literary texts help them to develop the intercultural communicative competence by putting these two interdisciplinary elements. In, like I said before, intercultural competence and the literary texts. 
I used for data collection instruments, I used four. I used uh, direct observations or field notes. I took notes every single class, you know, writing what they did. And after each class finished, I complemented the field notes uh, in relation to the experience they had uh, working with the literary text. And of course, focusing, I focus a lot on the cultural topics that they discussed in class uh, during class sessions. And uh, I also uh, held a semi-structured interview at the end of the experience. It was an individual um, interview asking them about how they had felt about interacting or reading the, the literary text and especially what cultural content they had learned. Also, I requested students to write journals. in which they gave, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> reflective opinions about the experience. And I also collected students' artifacts because they wrote responses about the literary uh, texts, for example, like essays or commentaries on the characters, on the conflicts uh, the characters had. So I collected all, all uh, that data. Of course, as a researcher, I uh, analyze the data through a process of triangulation. Uh, I compare and analyze uh, the four data collection instruments in order to identify significant opinions, attitudes, and comments about the literary texts and the approaches applied. I segmented, coded, and categorized data into units of analysis. I identified patterns and similar opinions. Uh, and at the end, I stated findings. Um, I just want to present, this is just the end of the presentation. <laughs> uh, these are some of the findings because there are many findings in my book, but I just picked the most important ones. Um, one of the most inter interesting findings, I was surprised because of this finding, is that students value very much the history as related to the analysis of the literary text. And then the finding is the history of the U.S. can be studied through multicultural literary texts when historicizing. I'm going to read this sample of data first, and then I'm going to uh, comment the implication of that. Um, it says, uh, this is taken from the interview. Anna, who is one of the, my participants, says, I have learned a lot in this course because in before, well, the speaker means previous classes, we didn't have the opportunity to read those kinds of texts, multicultural text, texts. For example, I've learned about the black power movement, economic problems and discrimination, problems about immigration problems, racism, that's what she says. Uh, if we analyze that uh, piece of data in context, we can see that the student is, was able to develop intercultural competence at a deep level, at a critical level. She is recognizing that she, was, uh, she had the opportunity to learn elements of deep culture, like when she talks about the, the black power movement. And I remember that this, uh, uh, in order to contextualize this data, is it happened when we read the short story Every Day Used by Alice Walker. And uh, they were very interesting about the Black Power Movement, not only as a political, uh, uh, a political group, but as, an, but as an artistic literary group. And at that time, it was the opportunity to speak about discrimination, you know, and, and it related to the historical aspect that I'm talking about. Uh, as the name suggests, suggests uh, there, historicizing. So when history, talking about history in a critical way, gave a student the opportunity to develop their intercultural communicative competence in a different way, in a critical way. They were not speaking about you know, issues of fashion or music or food. They were more concerned about other let's say, conflicting topics 
of uh, the American society in this case, such as discrimination, immigration problems, racism. So it shows, in a cert in, uh, as, as the data shows, they develop intercultural communicative competence in terms of knowledge. As, as the uh, participants, participant says, I have learned. Well, here I have another example related to that, that they give importance to history as an important aspect to develop intercultural communicative competence. Mercedes says in one of the logs, I think that I became more critical and analytical about how some people dominate and how others are dominated. I consider that seeing reality from another point of view, through literature and history, gave me the possibility to analyze and realize about our situation as Latino people. So for me, as a teacher researcher, this was uh, important data because the speaker is actually recognizing that she became critical and analytical about the cultural events of the literary text, or uh, cultural events that are presented in the literary text, which is for me meaningful data. Um, and you know, this speaker is assuming a position like, I consider that seeing reality from another point of view. Although she was not clear by saying another point of view, which one it was. It suggests that she was learning culture uh, through the literary texts in a different way, which we, we assume that she was getting, uh, she was learning important information, for example, in this case about Latinos, the situation of Latinos living in the United States. So learning culture in a more critical way. Another important finding is that the literary texts depict uh, unequal social differences and gender roles in both social and family settings through the character's interaction. Because of time, I, I won't read this because I think it is much better to read the second one according to my analysis. I chose two, two pieces of data. This data says, even though the role of woman as a wife, ah, well, the context is uh, when we were reading the short story, Woman Holy in Creek by Sandra Cisneros. Uh, then, uh, students were asked uh, to write a response paper about the character that is Cleophilus, who represents, um, you know, the, the, the woman of a, the, the, let's say the Latino woman who is submissive and dominated by her husband. That is the context. Then the, the student says, even though the role of woman as a wife and as a mother has changed in last decades, there's, sti there's still a patriarchal culture in which the man is who dominates. That is to say, the chauvinist Latino culture prevails and the woman is submitted to man's will. Cleophilus is a submissive and obedient wife who is abused by her husband, but who does not do anything to change her situation as she resigns herself. Well, Again, we can see in this piece of data how the students are being very critical about intercultural issues, and in this case, relate to issues of family setting and uh, gender roles. As she is criticizing how women are submitted by, by uh, Latino men still in the present. Okay? And it implies that she is actually doing like a critical analysis uh, of this situation, developing in this way her intercultural communicative competence as, as she is analyzing a uh, Mexican-American character as presented in the story. Uh, also the multicultural, it's another finding, the multicultural literary texts provide the means to identify and to learn about important traditions and cost customs involving diverse ethnic backgrounds. Uh, this is one of the most important findings in my study because the students actually were able to identify, to uh, analyze, and to give their personal opinions about tra traditions and ideologies that are not easy observable when we study culture. This is taking, this sample is taking from from one class on 
Alice Walker's short story, Everyday Use. And uh, the conflict is about the meaning of some quilts. You know that the quilts are a meaningful, important African-American tradition for, for this, for, for African-American people. So quilts, uh, for us maybe quilts are not that much like, exactly, and we don't care. But the interesting finding is that students actually were able to construct meaning out of this short story and give meaning to the use of the quilts. The data says Maggie, who is one character of the, well, there are two characters, uh, Maggie and her mother, two characters of the story, want to keep the quilts in order to preserve their African tradition of using the quilts for everyday use. And the challenge of the students was to discover what, what is the meaning of everyday use, because that is the title of the story, Every, everyday use, what is that? But we can see here that, uh, like, like Maria's response paper says, she actually got the meaning and she says, that is putting them on bed, using them daily and seeing them each day are ways to demonstrate that the quilts are important because all the generations and the traditions of the family will never be forgotten. I guess that this is evidence of the fact that my students were acting like intercultural speakers, you know, trying to understand those cultural meanings, implicit cultural meanings in the literary text, because it is not easy to, to understand the meaning of the quilts when we read the story the first time. We need to, you know, read the short story several times in order to get them in. So this implies, one more, that students were dealing with uh, important issues, uh, complicated issues of deep culture, and in that sense they were um, being critical, developing their intercultural competence. Um, there is this other finding, questions and class discussion allow learners, well, I'm going to skip it because I know that, because of time. I, I guess that I'm going to, to, to present just the, the last one, which is this one. Let's see this one. No, the, la the, the very last. Learners were able to compare cross-cultural literary and other kinds of content when reading multicultural literary texts. Uh, this is taken from the logs, and again, one student who referred to a uh, woman hollering creek, she says, in woman hollering creek, I, I saw that women's position in Mes Mexico is similar to women in Colombia. And this is very interesting um, for me as a researcher. It says, I felt identified with the story because some girls think that a kind of charming prince is going to save them from their desperate lives. What I see here is that, is that the student, you know, developed the skill of comparing, as proposed by the model by, by, uh, given by Byron. She was able to compare, um, first of all, to, to understand the, the story, second, to interpret the story, and then to compare the character situation with herself, yes? And then she says, uh, I felt identified with the story, and I, I think that that is one of the main aspects of developing intercultural communicative competence, when one is able to understand the other one, or people who belong to other culture, or when we are at least tolerant or, or ready to accept other cultural um, situations. So I think that this is one of the main achievements uh, in the research study because actually students were able to compare, to um, relate the literary texts to their personal lives. And that kind of experience um, shows that they were developing intercultural communicative competence. Well, the conclusions. I have several conclusions. I chose only four conclusions for this presentation. <coughs> The first one is <coughs> that the inclusion of literary texts, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the inclusion of literary texts in the EFL classroom brings more advantages than disadvantages. It enhances learners' knowledge, skill, and attitudes. Um, instead of just teaching 
grammar and teaching communicative functions. Actually, students can develop, a, can become intercultural speakers through literary texts in the classroom. It is true that they are not speaking with foreigners or with people from other cultures, but actually the voice of the author in the literary text is a person who represents the, the target culture. The second conclusion is that it is necessary to establish interdisciplinary connections among different areas, like for example, the ones that I use, pedagogy, literature, literary studies, and teaching methods, methods to help EFL learners enhance intercultural communicative competence. It is a necessity in the EFL classroom. And the third one is that multicultural literature helps students to be critical about pre-established and traditional cultural ideologies. Learners can transform, criticize, and reshape cultural meanings that have always been considered static or you not know, like have been and moved. They, they criticize and then they transform culture because as we know, culture always is transforming. The impact of my book. Uh, the first one is that several articles have been published derived, derived from this book and, and this research project in, and they have been published in several scientific journals. The second one is uh, that I gave a presentation on, on the book eh, in La Escuela de Ciencias del Lenguaje y la Maestría en Estudios Interlingüísticos e Interculturales de la Universidad del Valle, he held in August 10, 27. They invited me to give a presentation on this book, and now the book is there, and it is uh, in the library there as a reference for those students who are working of, on intercultural topics. And uh, the other one is that my research work, including the articles, have been cited, which is actually one of my main achievements after all this research project that I have done. Sorry, but I guess that I, creo que me pasé, but uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Sí, <laughs> ya. Thank you very much. <coughs> Easy to follow, your ideas are clearly presented, and it is very organized, and I think it's a, it's a must. <laughs> and uh, it you had a plus in your book <coughs> that when we read, we really know. Uh, where we're going and what we, what to expect and everything is really nicely written in your book. Um, so congratulations on that. Uh, also, I think um, it's a challenging take to bring literature into the English language teaching uh, because, well, we, we know that we're not a culture that reads much, mm. and let alone in English. Uh, but it's uh, interesting that you bring this into the EFL class. The other thing I, I found um, a plus in your books is this practical experience, because sometimes we talk about the wonders of doing this and that, but in abstract terms, mm -hmm. so in theory it sounds beautiful, mm -hmm. but then how to do it, like in the everyday use, <laughs> but in the classroom, <laughs> yes, how, how do you do it in the classroom? And you have this chapter in which you explain how you did it, and also these approaches. I think that I, I also like this chapter very much, and the one you mentioned, your favorite was my favorite too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think uh, that is also something that uh, the book um, brings to, to students, to teachers, on how to do it for real in the classroom. So I think that, that it's very interesting. Um, and I think I have two questions or three questions, probably. 
easy questions. <laughs> is uh, one is well, some of my struggles in the book was with the critical with critical intercultural competence because I have reading other stuff and it's a little bit different from what you presented. Um, so <coughs> kind of that was a little bit lost for me in the book, but my questions have to do more with, um, I'm not sure, but I think Sandra Cisneros uses Spanglish in her texts, right? Hmm. Uh, so one of the questions is, because of these dominant ideologies about English and the purity of English mm. and all these things, I have found that some students resist when we enact our bilingualism. Mm -hmm. So when we use English and Spanish, it's like a crime. So I wonder if in your experience mm -hmm. with uh, using these texts, for example, Sandra Cisneros, if they had any type of resistance to to the use of bilingualism in the text. That's one thing. And Can the I answer other. Now? Because oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, actually, uh, I remember very well that they were surprised. Actually, they didn't resist mm -hmm. to that because I agree with you most of the time. We even teachers criticize students when they speak in Spanish mm -hmm. in class. But actually, they act actually admired the fact that Santa Cisneros used Spanish. And uh, since, like I said in my presentation, they were doing this historical research mm -hmm. previous to reading the literary text. They, they came when we, they came prepared with the idea that Spanglish is part of Santa Cisneros' um, hmm. literary production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were ready to, mm -hmm. to, to do that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that much, there wasn't that much resistance from them because uh, they understood that that is one of the elements that Sandra Silvero uses in her, in her, in her literary right. work, actually as a way to, you know, identify her, her, style? her style, her writing, and identify her Mexican roots. So it didn't happen, but I have heard of okay. cases that students resist. Yes. Okay, oh, thank you. And uh, with something that I did with some of my, one of my um, doctoral students is to revise lots of um, uh, study plans from different universities in Colombia, and we see that this is a recurrent pattern that is one semester or one uh, classes, American literature and British literature, but we are still like in this frame that literature for uh, language students is uh, American or British. And here you bring, well, I mean, you bring American, but an enhanced view of American literature. So this is more like a question to think about the future and is if you have thought about proposing some changes in the, in the study plan to include this multicultural view of literature that includes not only American or British and not only these, because this is a wide, um, yes. exactly, uh, it's enriching, but also if you have plan or thought to engage into bringing a little bit more variety and diversity to to yes, I, I agree with you. The situation at the time is that because we have a, a, a literature co course that is called American, American literature, literature, right? And I was doing, I was doing my research study there uh -huh. in that class. So I was also, you know, limited, limited by that hmm. context. So mm -hmm. the the option that I had in my mind was okay, multicultural literature of the U.S., but of course. Uh, we need to include uh, other other kinds of multicultural literature coming from different uh, different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Actually, there is a theory that says that uh, world literature is multicultural. So um, even translation, when I was speaking uh -huh. about translation, you know, uh, for example, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is now being translated in yeah. English in many mm -hmm. American. 
uh, schools, mm -hmm. which is part of a more of a broader uh, literary uh, spectrum. Exactly, mm -hmm. spectrum. Mm -hmm. But we are working on that because in the new programs that we have, uh, we have changed the programs, mm -hmm. the study pl plans here. We are starting this semester mm -hmm. with the first, mm -hmm. with the first semester. Actually, we wow, had that idea in great. mind. Great. We need to include yeah. voices yeah. from, yeah. Uh, from, for example, the colonies, uh, right? Yeah. Of the British Empire, yes. and uh, we have. We need to include, for example, literature from from Puerto Rico, from Las Americas, like they call exactly. the Americas. Mm -hmm. We are we are planning to do that, and we are working on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I agree with Carmen Elena. I felt very, very happy reading your book because it's very clear. I think it's, well, very fluent I mean, in the, all of the ideas. And also I feel comfortable reading because of what we share in certain things, yes, some authors. But um, I would like to ask you a question, but it's much more related to well, what you do now, what you are now, because of this is what, what happens in the front of your doctoral studies. Also it happens to me. I have to revisit, right. yes, and rewrite many things. So don't you feel like it is happening to you now? I mean, in, in terms of viewing uh, ICC, the Intercultural Communicative Competence, because of you really know that it is much more related to this European framework. Like, uh, well, I agree with Byron, I agree with all of these sort of things in terms of analyzing ICC, in terms of identifying the three main components of ICC, like attitudes, knowledge and skills. But this is what, what happens for the European context because of what we really know, well, what's going on with interculturality there, the problems well with migration. I'm not saying that it's not happening to Latin America in this moment, but the context, but the context is quite different, yes? The problem of migration, the problem piece of the society there. So don't you feel like uh, um, you have to revisit it also with the concept of interculturality for Latin American context, because you really know what we have now, well, debating a lot in Latin America because of the problem with uh, inequalities, yes, of these inequalitarian societies are quite the same, yes, in Latin America, situations, yes, that we face in Brazil, in uh, <coughs> Argentina, in Chile, in Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia. So, well, the frame, yes, it's, it's completely different. So, don't you feel like it is necessary to revisit it, yes, that concept? Yes, uh, it is important to take into account that this book is based on, on a, a study that I, that I carried out in, in 2010. Yeah. So, of course, uh, we need to take into account that, that time. Yeah. But yes, I completely agree with you. We need to revisit. We, people yeah, right. who are interested on intercultural competence, we need to revisit and, you know, find other theories. There, I mean, like I said before, this topic is still in, you know, exploration. is still a matter of uh, of uh, study. Therefore, we need to to do that kind of, you know, revisiting. It's, right. it's necessary. Yes, and find other ways to, to teach, uh, um, to help students develop intercultural competence through other kinds of resources. But there is also another problem, and that is my personal uh -huh. opinion, is that although, for example, Byron's model was it's still there, but it, it was mm -hmm. proposed a long time ago, I believe that teachers still in action in real practice, in every day use, I still continue teaching grammar and communicative functions. So teachers are also behind, you know, the advances on 
intercultural communicative competence. Um, many teachers continue teaching surface levels of culture. Right. So I guess that, that is another point that we need to take into account. Right. And nobody yeah. nobody doubts yes, the effects of this research, I mean, in the context yeah, of course. EFL, because, well, we really know that we need urgent transformations in teaching languages because of well, we are still based on language, but language is a very restricted point of view. Language as a system, but not language as language, or maybe the ways in which people can communicate, the ways in which well, we can construct yes, these new worlds. So that's basically well, what is happening. So whenever you include such topics in EFL context, I absolutely believe, yes, you can bring good results. I'm not saying yes, it's, it's wrong, mm -hmm. because even in my case, I suggest those transformations in the classroom in terms of changing the mentality, in terms of analyzing different ways in which well, we, you can develop interculturality, like you said. Literature, literature, I think, is, 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 is a powerful tool that we can use, because of what is literature? Literature, is, it means to create new worlds, to view the world into different mm -hmm. perspectives. This is what, what we need. Once you read a book, you feel like you, you live in a different world. Even you can take up a different role. Sometimes, yes, you take up the role of, well, any agent there, any actor. So you say, oh, I identify, as one of your students mentioned, uh, yeah. I feel identified with that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's amazing that you can do that because of, well, it's part of interculturality. But the biggest problem is the concept of interculturality in Latin America. You really know that Zarate, the Zosa, so they say Watch. that interculturality is used mm -hmm. in most of Latin American contexts as a, as a rhetoric, yes, tool. It's yes, it's romanticism. It's just yeah. maybe to create a wonderful world, what? yes, to be tolerant. Yeah. What is tolerance? Tolerance is also a concept that it is used in Latin American societies to impose, yeah. yes, these situations, to impose, yes, to impose inequalities. Mm -hmm. This is basically what, what you say. So that's what, what we try to do, the same things in English. So we have to be very careful because consciously or unconsciously, yes, if we adopt these sort of frameworks, well, we are just becoming, yes, tolerant to what society. So this is well a controversial yes. Yes, aspect. I'm still struggling yes, a lot yes, on, that, on that concept, but I say you can do it yes, in an EFL classroom, but you have to be very careful because of, you can say, I feel identified what with this author, with this American yes, writer, but it's because of you, but what about yes, you, you the students, in what context? So also you can well, communicate also your messages, and then you try to install those messages to your students. So you have to be very, very, very careful, yes, of using interculturality. Well, fortunately, well, we do not have the last answer, yes, in terms of saying, well, yes. this is what, what we should do in our ELT right. classrooms. So we are trying to approach it, yes, day by day, this in different in different ways, but the most important is to change the mentality of what language is, what language means for the students. Yes, in context like Colombia, which, to be honest, literature should be defined differently, because what's literature? So, for instance, you can say in this, I was very happy to get back to this university because I was graduated many, many, many years. Yeah, it's in my master's. Your, yes, in Sinde. Sinde, well, yeah. And then I said, look, this is a different way of reading the university nowadays. So even talking to people, even I said, how can I get this building, for instance? It was amazing. So that's part of literature. Yes, you know what I mean? It's not those canons, yes, what you say, okay, now let's see Garcia Marquez because it's the representative of Colombian literature. But what about the other literature? Yes, we can say the small L. Yeah. <laughs> also, I didn't say yes. the small is actually polemic and complicated because that would be kind of offensive 
to to say uh, yeah. 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 I mean, right I mean, the term important minority important. groups or yes. right. minority is uh, is uh, complex because many authors don't agree with that name they say no we are not a minority right we are part of the literary canon and like the white authors who are there in their high position minority authors also belong to that to that level they are not yeah. so it is part of the discussion right. that is going on in terms of cultural identity right because all the, and so so for example k who is one um one uh, an author who supports multicultural literature says that the term uh, mo uh, cultural uh, minority groups or yes minority groups is it's kind of offensive and offensive mm -hmm. classification for them yeah so Definitely. this is part of the discussion that is going on yeah. on, yeah. on interculturality or uh, multicultural literature yeah. But the thing with, right. with my, this label minority in political terms is that it grants them rights. It's like so like that's, they are it's yeah. complex. Yeah. But at the end of the day, yes, so the minority is the majority. Yeah. The minority <laughs> is the majority. It's, it's, well, like right. it is yeah. not represented in such a way. I it's, it's, it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. So it is positive. Definitely. And well, I say. Ah, sí, es positivo. Thanks a lot. Well, um, first of all, my concept is favorable. The concept is favorable. <laughs> I start with, with that. Camera, right? uh, yeah, yeah, so that it is clear, yeah. Um, I wanted to, to say, or I want to say that uh, at the beginning, I said, no, I'm not going to be able to evaluate this book because Luis Fernando is my friend. Um, so, because of you know, things, you know? But then they said, no, no problem, because anyway, uh, you're going to evaluate it from your knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, yes, I accept, because I wanted to accept. But uh, you know that sometimes things uh, might go wrong and that, <laughs> yes. So, and then when I received it, I said, oh my God, that's too thick <laughs> for me, because I, actually it was in a sabbatical year, so. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, it is thick, and I started to read it, but I was so eager to finish it that I guess in two days or three days, I read it all because it was very clear. I would say that even a student who is in the previous semesters of the undergraduate program mm -hmm. might read little by little, of course, I mean, guided by a teacher. But I would say that because of the language that you use, the clarity, etc., so it's not going to be very difficult for, for a student who has not graduated uh, yet from the undergraduate program. So in terms of the clarity, uh, etc., I would say that uh, I really enjoyed it. I also enjoyed it from the point of view of the rigorous process of research that you followed, very clear for a student who is doing the master's degree, the doctoral uh, degree also, very clear to follow that process uh, because it was explained uh, completely. Sometimes when we write, we, let's say, leave parts aside because we say, well, that might not be important. Mm -hmm. uh, but here you, you uh, included everything of the process itself. Also, I want to congratulate you because, as you said, it was an interdisciplinary study which comprised TESOL, literature, pedagogy, intercultural competence, which it's difficult, I would say. I have uh, written several documents, books, etc., and it has been like difficult to comprise everything. So congratulations for that. Uh, one concern is, m m I mean, I have an opposite concern to the one you have and the one that you might have. Uh, last week, with several teachers that are uh, teaching in the PhD program, including Alfonso Cardenas, uh, we discussed that we are worried because I don't know in other universities, in other programs, etc. but in our uh, teaching programs, in our licenciaturas, we are very worried because students are not paying attention to the correct use of language because they are going to be teachers. We've had that um, dilemma here. 
Some teachers say, no, the thing that matters here is that the students communicate something, that they get a message across. It doesn't matter if it is correct or not. Nowadays, we have the other, the opposite concern. Even Alfonso Cardenas said, well, we are dealing too much with intercultural competence, but we are not working on the correct use of the language anymore. We are not teaching mathematics students who, well, can speak English. If they don't do it well, no matter, no, no problem. It doesn't matter. Uh, we are not dealing with chemistry students who probably will go study uh, in an English uh, speaking country, etc. So we are dealing with teachers. So my concern is here that, yeah, and, and of course I agree with intercultural competence and that because, <laughs> all right, but, but how could we balance that? How could we balance that? I see that even in the first courses, mm. in, the, in the courses that we are going to start this week, uh, we are dealing too much with culture, but not with the language per se. So how could we balance that? I guess that the more he says it should be balanced, because the term is intercultural communicative competence. Hmm. And intercultural communicative competence is an extension of hmm. the concept of communicative competence. There, when we read intercultural communicative competence, the communicative part is there. <coughs> in other words, communicative competence is implicit in yeah. intercultural communicative competence. Mm -hmm. And we should understand as teachers that language is important. Mm -hmm. So, which is a challenge for us because yeah. we have more to teach and more to deal with in the classroom. Not only to teach lear learners to you know, uh, yeah. like you said, study language, speak it appropriately, but also deal mm -hmm. with the culture. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as I understand, the concept of intercultural community yeah. competence, yeah. the competence, the mm competence -hmm. is there. The linguistic competence, yeah. the pragmatic yeah. competence, mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the strategic competence are there. Mm -hmm. Because this model, like I said before, is yeah. the extension of communicative competence. So as for us as English teachers, we have a double task. While teaching culture, we also need to teach the language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Because there is the confusion. Sometimes uh, teachers believe that to teach co uh, communi we should develop uh, students' intercultural competence. Com yeah. But if we pay attention to the term, a good intercultural speaker is the one who is able to use both. Yes. Um, you know, the language in order to communicate mm -hmm. or to understand, mm -hmm. but also deal with these other competences like <coughs> interpreting, uh, discovering, yeah. and the cultural yeah. messages. That is the big yeah. compromise. And I agree we with have. you, yes, and we know that we should deal with all those uh, things, but the issue is here how to. I don't know, the convinced teachers that yes, we are dealing yes. with, that we are educating future teachers and they, they, they have to speak correctly. So I understand, as you said, literature as a resource to improve language, etc., etc. Et but when the teacher closes the classroom, he does whatever he I or she wants, right? Can I say, can I say I something? Mean, yes, please. I think, yeah. well, this is debatable. Yeah. Yeah, course, yeah, but yeah. this is not this yes. is not mm. is the point for the presentation but yeah. but of course I think is is a huge problem that mm. I think is that mm. people are not well informed yes mm. on what ICC means or what interculturality is yes. or what culture teaching means mm. because of whenever you teach a language well you have to teach the culture yes. mm. I think yes the biggest problems in our classrooms is that we divide one thing has to do with yes. language, another when, thing yeah. has to do with mm. culture. And then yes. once you divide mm. that, that's well what you start to create those prescriptive yes, attitudes about mm. language. If you concentrate on language, this is the right way off. Yes. So, but nowadays nobody, mm. nobody can say this is the right way. So it depends hmm. maybe on the context, it depends maybe on the person you are talking to, it depends on the topics, it depends on lots of circumstances yes, that you have to do. So hmm. what is going to be the appropriate way of using the language? Well, that's what you have to consider yes. in such hmm. a way. Sometimes hmm. I have to, 
he has stopped my students mm. when they are using the language and then they say, Carlos, why you are stopping me? And say, mm -hmm. yes, do not allow me to talk. I said, you are forgetting you, who you are talking to. Yes, I'm the teacher here. So yeah. I'm not, yes, your colleague, I'm not, yes, out of the classroom or something like that. Yeah. I, I wouldn't like to sound, yes, prescriptive teacher. On the contrary, yeah. it's a language user. Me neither, it's a language yeah. user. As a language user, then you have yes. to say, please consider lots of variables, yes, that mm. influence on language use. But please do not ask me what it's going to be the right or the correct mm. way of, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's nothing. It's, it's, it's because of now what it is happening is this. That's why probably we have to adequate the language according to, to yeah. or yes, to these circumstances. But we have maybe to forget to use the word of correctness. Correct. Correctness. Yeah. Yeah, in Correctness immediately maybe includes, yes, that idea of prescribing. Yeah. And remember that mm. nowadays that we are much more concerned correct. on describing mm. the language. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm not uh, prescriptive either. Yeah. But I would say that the issue here is that we have, maybe because of the boom several years ago of ICC, uh, we left aside like that. Maybe, yeah, not correctness, but the, the appropriate ways, way in which you uh, communicate something with the, let's say, good structure, good vocabulary, good intonation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, especially because they are going to be future teachers. So, and, and my, my issue here is, well, we are not to, to teach functions, uh, grammar, as you said, right? But to make the balance, because we are going to, to the other side. And my invitation here to Luis Fernando and to myself also, is to, to uh, and I have it here also, to, let's say, try to take a stance and to try to intervene in the design of the new programs. Because I, as I saw last week, for example, we are dealing too much with culture, but language is left aside. Language as, as such, I'm, I know that language includes intercultural competence and everything. But let's say like, if I don't, yeah, if I can't use the correct way, so at least, or I use the correct way because they are going to be teachers. So uh, they cannot be talking as uh, uh, always as uh, people uh, on the streets talk, et cetera. So, I would say that we should take like yes, because the stand there like and, and the a balance. And anyway, use speaking. literature as a resource, anyway, and for intercultural competence. So I'm not biased saying that intercultural competence shouldn't be, uh, uh, I mean, fostered. Because anyway, I would be denying all the work that I have done <laughs> so far. <laughs> OK, so well, uh, and the other thing is, aren't we making, if we, if we uh, complain, because our students are becoming lazier. Aren't we motivating or, let's say, stimulating them to be even lazier if we ask them to read short stories and not novels as we used to read? Well, just a curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a <accurate>. curiosity. <laughs> I guess that, uh, based on my experience as a literature teacher, I'm uh, speaking about that, uh, reading novels uh, would be more complicated for them. Although they do it. Like yeah. For example, I, every semester I give my students one novel to read, no more than that. Mm -hmm. Cause, but because they need to have that experience yes. anyway. Yes. But for a research project like this, that I was, you know, trying to foster students' intercultural competence, I definitely voted for including the short stories as because of the arguments that I presented. Uh, and it doesn't mean that is it is that they are becoming lazier. Mm -hmm. It is just that it's more appropriate for them to deal with first mm -hmm. of all language because they are dealing with literary language. And yeah. literary language in a way is already more complicated. <laughs> complicated. Yeah. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not the, the normal language, the normal yeah. communicative language we speak daily. It is sophisticated language. It is uh, sophisticated. It has uh, <laughs> allusions, uh, other different metaphors, metaphors, symbols. Mm -hmm. yeah. literature. So I give that short story for 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 EFL learners 
are more um, manageable, manageable yeah, for them to, <laughs> to yeah. deal with the literary analysis uh -huh. and to deal with the intercultural uh, uh, right, component. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if I answer. I don't know. That's a curiosity. Because so. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah. Yeah. we complain that students are lazy, you know, they don't want to read so much. So. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations yeah. again. Yeah. Muchas gracias a nuestros tres evaluadores. Eh, cuarto punto, espacio para intercambio con la comunidad académica. No sé si alguno de los asistentes desea tener una palabra de agradecimiento hacia el profesor Fernando. Uh, well, as a person who uh, had the fortune of of uh, taking the American English literature, the first literature that we have here. In, in the university. I think that um, the approach that the teacher selected regarding what the teacher was done the same, um, the working with two stories was um, a good choice because, well, talking from my experience, it was like the best way to connect literature, to love the literature, to, to analyze it well, to, to fall in love with it. Uh, I agree with the teacher was saying. Um, it, it is like kind of shocking when you uh, are going to start uh, reading maybe a complete novel that is going to have more than 300 mm. pages or something <laughs> like that. So if you go step by step and then uh, just start by short stories, poems, because we, do, we analyze poems first, then short stories, then a novel, and then um, a play. Uh, it is like. Uh, the best way to have, to have it, everything complete in one class. Mm -hmm. So so I agree with that. Um, and I loved the presentation and everything that I shared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was my standard. Great. So you're <laughs> in this. Huh? He wasn't my participant. Ah, he no. wasn't. But he was one of my students. Uh, I want to first congratulate you, Professor. Um, well, I study here, the undergraduate program, and when I studied literature, we took it from different perspectives because we had different teachers. We had um, teacher Berta, who taught me American literature. Berta Ramos. And Berta Osorio de Parra. She used to have us read full novels, right? Yeah. Yes, she actually connected her personal library to yeah. the department. So I was at that time. And it reminds me of the times of when I was studying literature here. And also now as a teacher, teacher researcher, I'm concerned about how the way we teach literature in our classes. I got my students read a couple of short stories. Mm -hmm. uh, actually one story I wrote at Centro Lenguas from Universidad Pedagogica. Mm -hmm. And um, and without knowing that, I, I was kind of implementing interculturality or fostering intercultural competence by making them analyze and reading from different perspectives. But that happened because of the master program. I mean, it was like kind of, an in, I was influenced because of that and because of my previous experience as a, a free service teacher. And, um, and it definitely opens the gates of different possibilities to teach literature. Mm -hmm. you know, from the basic level, like uh, let's analyze grammar, because I, I used to do that, like take pieces of uh, text or passages just to get grammar and, and show students how grammar actually works. And that's not my intention anymore. I want them to analyze, to go deeper, and, uh, and the proposal that you, that you just presented um, enlightens somehow different approaches to, to, to actually foster their critical competence, intercultural competence, communicative competence. Um, and uh, it calls my attention that I'm using right now, these actual students have to do that this, by the end of the week, a debate based on what they read. So they have to choose a topic and then they have to uh, debate it they have to compare and to show their parents why it's debate, debatable and controversial. So they have to prepare, they have to do some investigation, obviously about the author, the culture, the, culture, the, the, the framework in which it was developed. So um, I am really interested to read your book, I haven't, and uh, 
and it's a challenge for teachers now for, for us that we are teaching to discover different ways in which literature can be combined in the EFL setting not only as, as I said before as uh, grammar or just as a means to learn the language but as a further possibility for students to get critical uh, knowledge so it was very um, let's say um, like an, a wide opening uh, an, an opening uh, presentation for me at least so I, I congratulate you and I want to read your book so I have to, to ask you where I should or where I can buy or get your book well, this was an appetizer a good appetizer it will be offered to you. Ah. Please, please. I was waiting for a, a serious decision to start. Ah, this is how it works. Ah, it's what? It's what? So it depends maybe on, the, I, on this I presentation. Think, uh, ah. Yes, I, yes. Otherwise, well, you cannot. I'll pull his eyes. I'm lost. No, it is published. I was waiting. <laughs> it is already for, published. Ah. But it is yeah. published. It is. Yes, it is published. Ah. But uh, to share with, to share with my yeah. students, oh, good. I was waiting for a serious ah. evaluation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah. yeah. I'm sorry. Well, for you. Yeah. I misunderstood. Yeah, it was. A good romance to speak. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, uh, I wanted to say something with relation to what you suggested to read, like post-colonial literature. Yeah. Decolonial, no, decolonial, de de yeah, de de there is a space where one can do it in pedagogica, and it's this course on English language and literary production. Um, Marcella gave me her program, but I changed it. Mm -hmm. So what I will do is read some short stories, because mm -hmm. I agree with reading short stories, uh, one from an Indian writer, one from Jinwa so, Achibi, African? Mm -hmm. African, mm -hmm. Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, one from George Orwell, the time when he was mm -hmm. a, in India as administrator, mm -hmm. as an official. And Sh shooting an elephant? Yes, shooting an elephant. Mm -hmm. The standard. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it's good because it's an introduction. Yeah. And then the students have to read one novel during the whole semester, but only one. Right. And mm -hmm. there I will propose Things Fall Apart from mm -hmm. Jinwa Achibi, mm -hmm. and Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, mm -hmm. which deals with the colonization mm -hmm. of Congo. So in Pedagogica there are spaces where one can mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting. All right. I have to rush. Yes, but we have to close the door to the participants, to the evaluators, and we have to confirm the sustentation where it is registered. Eh, cada uno de los conceptos eh, van a firmar, luego esto ya va a un consejo académico de aprobación y sí, el acto administrativo que le va a conceder el ascenso de categoría por el profesor Fernando. Eh, Empieza a regir cuál por asistir y felicitaciones. Hasta el próximo, el año siguiente. Sí, gracias. Gracias.